Hey, everybody. Welcome to the GMI Rocket Show. Today's episode number 80. I'm your host, Roman Zalchenko. I am a former immigration attorney turned entrepreneur, uh, the founder of Laborless, co-founder of Laborless, which is an immigration tech startup that automates H-1B visa compliance, and also the founder of GMI Rocket, uh, which is a digital marketing agency for the immigration and mobility industry, and also, of course, which brings you this show. Um, I'm really excited today. Our guest is coming to us, joining us uh, actually in the U.S., but he's typically from the U.K. Um, our guest today is Paul Bennett, who is the CEO and co-founder of a company called PerchPeak. Um, so PerchPeak is a uh, basically a relocation platform that's super focused on the assignee, on the person who's relocating. Uh, and so it enables you know companies and other uh, users to help move an individual along their relocation journey, but you know, is really centered towards the experience for the individual in terms of them having access to documentation, in terms of them, you know, understanding where they are in the process and, and other and other pieces of the puzzle. Um, I'm really excited to discuss this. I love the fact that companies are moving into a sort of um, user first or user centric uh, you know, point of view. So I, I really love that. So without further ado, um, please. Welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. As am I, Roman. Thanks for such a gracious introduction. Uh, you, I couldn't have put it better myself. I, I was gonna. Whenever I do that, I sometimes worry that you know I perhaps misspoke or, or said something no, wrong. No, but, uh, no. you, you nailed it, buddy. You absolutely <laughs> nailed it. Awesome. Um, well, thanks for being here, and and you know, again, I'm I'm excited that you're actually in the states, um, mm. uh, just because I'm obviously I, typically. It is quite um, late, your show. Quite late for yeah, my exactly. show. Yeah. yeah so so. I, I appreciate you and I appreciate your time. So I, I know you are uh, here right now, but you are originally, uh, you know, you were born in the UK, you grew up in the UK. And I do typically love to start off these episodes just kind of getting to know the guests, mm -hmm. you know, and like getting to know your life and sort of where you've, you've you, how you spent your early days in your life and, and things like that. And so um, I, tell me if you can a little bit like, you know, who was Paul as, yeah. a, as a younger kid? You know, were you the lemonade stand or selling yeah. baseball cards kind of kid or video games or, you know, studious? Yeah. Like, tell me a little bit about that. I would say I'd love to be one of those people who was just like, yeah, you know, I was running the school tuck shop age four and turned my first profit age five. But <laughs> sadly, that, that, that wasn't quite the case for me. I was uh, far too busy generally just playing as much sport as possible. That was really, uh, was very fortunate to have a, uh, a very sport and uh, fun field um, upbringing to be, to mm -hmm. be honest and very, very grateful to, to my parents for that so um, pretty much anything under the sun um, and I think probably uh, early memory you can't really see it on a video but I'm relatively tall I'm six foot four and I was having a growth spurt aged uh, age 13 or 13 or so and my back just suddenly became out and like, it was just it was nothing serious, but went to the physio and he was like, oh, how much sport are you playing? Like, I was like, well, in the morning, lunchtime at school, after school, and <laughs> wow. then in the evening. So it was it was pretty intense um, uh, growing up, um, but heaps of fun. So many of my best friends are still from various sporting teams growing up. So that, that was, I would say, the dominant theme of my mm -hmm. childhood. Um, and then, yeah, I would say like when I think back to my, my childhood, it's just always like, various sports teams various pitches and traveling around the the country uk is relatively small so it's not that big a deal but playing playing games were you uh when you were that age i mean i'm assuming this is grade school kind of you know younger yeah, yeah. through teenage years were did you want to be a professional athlete like was that kind of your life goal it's it's a great question yeah definitely at the time um i remember Ironically now, because something you can tell through video is that I'm very skinny, so I would have been a terrible rugby player. But back in, back before it became, everyone started to grow up. Um, I wanted to be a professional rugby player. Um, I know that's not a not a super popular sport in the states, but it's a very uh, it's like American football without the pads. Um, yeah. And <laughs> so I wanted to do that, and then um, I actually ended up playing a lot of field hockey and um, tennis and cricket um, after and. So the obligatory soccer, which I think everyone uh, everyone plays. Uh, I'm trying to use soccer for your American audience. I <laughs> hope you appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I definitely wanted to be a professional. And then it, it's funny 
looking back, it was probably around the age of sort of 15 or so, you were like, okay, this is uh, not good enough at any of these sports and like the amount of commitment you have to put in there. Um, but still, so it was, I, I think if you play sports as a kid, most people fantasize about like, I don't know, playing at the World Cup or winning Wimbledon or something similar. It, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it's cool. And, and I, I think there's a lot of drive. I mean, to your point, you know, you made that decision. It's possible mm. that you would have, if you made the opposite decision, you could have gotten to a place where you were, you know, who knows, but yeah. the point is that you, in, in your early days, like you kind of put work and put your time and energy towards something that you loved, yeah. um, which is pretty cool. I mean, it, it, you know, there are a lot of kids who would hate playing sports and you, even if they're fully capable physically, you know, so yeah. it's great that you, you, you focused on what you love. Um, now, did you, when you, when, you know, you kind of, around university age, so 16, 17, 18 years old, you obviously, it sounds like, made the decision that, okay, well, I'm not going to be a professional rugby player or yeah, a yeah. professional you know, athlete, at least then. I mean, first of all, probably not too late still. Who knows? True, true. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, but, you know, you, you decided that that might not be your career path. So what did you then decide? I mean, at hmm. that point, you know, were you thinking like, gosh, what do I do with my life? What do I study? Like, yeah. what did you do? Uh, I, I would say probably the... I was definitely one of those kids that actually let's 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 do two two things. So one was um sort of first proper ish taste was did a lot of sports coaching growing up, so that was great. And sort of could just stay and and do this. But um they have this great scheme in the UK called like the Young Enterprise Scheme, hmm. which is kind of like a uh for uh, towards the end of school when you're like 17 18 uh, kind of a structured program that encourages uh, students to to start a business um and provide some mentorship and um anyway it made it really easy to get together with a bunch of friends and uh, and start a business and um i just remember i it was quite quite a lot of us in our, our company and uh just absolutely loved it and it was me and um one other guy predominantly driving it and uh, at the time, it was a couple of things I remember particularly loving. One was just the ideation process of just like, particularly in that environment, what problem shall we even focus on? And um, but then through to, we ended up selling hand sanitizers because mm. it was, um, ironically, it would have been an amazing business had we kept going. <laughs> like, yeah. I was whenever um, it sort of COVID came around, I was like, I should dig out the old couple of boxes of hand sanitizers i still have in the garage but wow. um but at the time there was um a lot of uh bird flu in the uk and there was mm. a real shortage of um uh, particularly good quality spray hand sanitizers and we'd read some research that some people preferred spray anyway it was enough for us to go on and we we're like let's go with aardvark so it was the top, top of all the lists and anyway, and so mm. really loved that process and then um, we did it for a year. And I think the thing that I really loved was it was easy enough to bulk buy some hand sanitizers, get them branded, and then you were trying to sell it. And that was a time where I was just thought, wow, this is amazing. We would just really lean on our age and just beg supermarkets to say, do you mind if we stand outside and try and sell these things, go to fairs, etc." And that process, I just absolutely fell in love with like the the sort of early stage startup startup hustle so that was that was when i started thinking okay like entrepreneurship can be really fun and particularly sales could be really fun um and almost what i loved about it was it because it was a bit of a it it gave you an excuse almost to do things you probably wouldn't do in normal life it was you know oh well we're doing this program we have to go out and get sales and we have to create marketing videos and stuff like that so it really forced you to just be a bit daring and just like to get out there so we I'll, I'll share one of the marketing videos we created um afterwards but it was it was very very good fun so that that was actually quite like a a prominent and the sort of final thing on that was i remember a very good mate tom who was I, I was doing a lot of it with just spending hours on the phone discussing things and like he's still a very good mate but we don't spend hours on the phone anymore trust me so it's kind of like that moment where you're like wow this is so fun just noodling on ideas so that was probably like the first time i was like wow being an entrepreneur could be really really fun um then went to uh, 
uni as we would say in the uk right. or college um, for, right. for the american audience and was like okay i don't really know what i'm doing and um my, my dad was like you should get some proper work experience paul like if unless you want to be a coach of anything then your sports coaching hasn't been very useful so far uh, and then i went and got a uh, an internship at an investment bank which was uh Credit Suisse, I think, right? Oh, wow, yeah. very well researched. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Credit Suisse, which was uh, another, I guess, pivotal, pivotal time in my my, my life. From a, I did a lot of growing up. That it's a ten week program, but uh, yeah, it was a really, really interesting time. And now, did you do that after your first year of, of uni, or was that sort of later on in your co- in your career? Uh, or your so university career. University, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did it in my second year summer. Got it. Um, so first year summer, I did work. I worked at a very small bank. Um, first year in the UK, it's a funny one. It, there aren't that many formal programs you can apply to, so you're sort of scrambling around um, to to try and find something. And then it was, uh, but what I did do was what the banks have is they do these things called spring weeks, where they try and. I don't want to say like prey on unsuspecting first years like me, but they basically try to be like, if we're the first people to offer like a formal path for university students, we can kind of get them in before anyone else. So I was like, mm-hmm. oh, that sounds good. And the uh, the spring week was in my first year. And that was honestly one of the most fun weeks of my life. It's a week. They're walking you through all the different things that an investment bank does. It's nine to five. It's drinks and boat cruises every evening. You're having inspiring talks. They're making it seem like it's the best thing ever. And then at the end of this week, they're like, oh, do you want to come and do an internship next year? And you're like, oh, my God, I get to avoid having to apply for internship. This is amazing. Like, Mm -hmm. sign me up. And met loads of really cool people, was in London for the first time, was like, I'm a big city baller now. So it was like, <laughs> uh, anyway, so needless to say, then started the internship in uh, second year summer. And it was just, uh, yeah, like it, it's it, particularly in investment banking, it was, it just wasn't really for for, for me. I, I, I loved aspects of it, but um, it was definitely a lot of um, busy work um some crazy hours some uh, just a lot of red lines for not for red line sake truthfully right. but it was a very very good experience to, to go through at that stage so i'm curious because um you know I, I i my first internship as well during university was at a, a investment bank as well yeah, after yeah. my first year um, one that doesn't exist anymore, Bear oh, Stearns. Nice. Oh, nice. Um, wow. And, a casualty. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and you know, I kind of grew up, if you will, in terms of my, prof- you know, I worked in retail and, and, and whatever yeah. beforehand, but that was my first kind of real kind of paycheck yeah. know, job. And um, I, I still credit the summers that I spent there. And then when I was in law school, and of course, after law school, I worked in some corporate environments. I always fancied myself somebody more entrepreneurial i think a little yeah. bit you know creating you know, whatever it is but i all but nevertheless i worked in these environments and one of the things that i credit to those environments is you know honestly just straight up learning how to be organized yes you know because when you step into a corporate environment you have access to this drive and you have to look into these folders and, and you know when you're saving things you have to save them with the correct naming and a lot of times it felt like red lines or red tape yeah. for the, just for the sake of it but i'm curious you know what were some of the takeaways that you had from that experience um and and, and i say this specifically because you know this is a podcast where i talk to business founders very often right yeah um, and I always hear, and I thought this myself too, like, oh, well, I can't start a business. I'm a corporate person. Like, I've yeah. never started a business. I've always worked in a big company. And if someone tells me that, I try to spin it the other way and say, fine, but oh. you've learned all these really great things along the way that will be really beneficial to you. So I'm curious, what are some of the things that you took away from that as your first, like, quote unquote, corporate experience? Uh, it, it's such a great question because the, uh, like, weird amounts considering it was only one summer um and particularly as you say just like you just get inundated with like just how to do things to quite a high standards and i think particularly in professional services the main thing obviously they're getting paid a ridiculous amount of money so everything has to be super high quality and mm-hmm. so that that quality bar is something that i think is it, it leads on to the red lines which sometimes can get a bit ott but really 
learning what good looks like was, I think, one one of the main things there. So that mm. that was that was amazing. Specifically in that world was Excel, which was so so valuable, and just being forced to use that hour and hours a day and get shortcuts done, and it, it's just still use a lot of that stuff today. And um, so that's that was super valuable, and actually stood me in good stead at, when I went to Amazon, and then now it's like so useful just being f- not. F- fluent in excel good in excel um and then the third thing i think that um it it really taught me positively was that um you you can actually influence things quite a lot um and particularly in this instance there were eight of us on our floor and eight interns this is and obviously they hope that five or six of the interns are going to take offers at the end of it if they made them and it turned out that six out of eight of us were going to say no and they got wind of this and then they started like really making our experience much much better so it's mm. kind of like that was quite an interesting one in the sense of like particularly if you drive things the right way and you present data then then you can actually influence change even in quite like old like rigorous rigorous environments from there um and so i, I feel to to your point around and we see this all the time now it's like we just see it when even when we're hiring people from great uh like professional services backgrounds they're just the quality of their work is typically high um and to your point i think not that it's easier but the majority of starting a business right is just executing and doing and and kind of that like one percent inspiration 99 percent perspiration idea and it's like if you have great skills that have been taught for you by other people really at their cost that's amazing and it's really hard to replicate so i I think it's like a an amazing amazing background to start something up at and we'll probably come on to speak about investing later but like investors love it as well because they're like this person actually knows how to get stuff done the flip side of it and the, the downside that i certainly found and i think is replicated like relatively early in your career in why I quite quickly thought professional services probably aren't for me is that I found that, and this is the thing for me that is difficult when you think of entrepreneurship is really professional services. A lot of the time, there's a very clear idea of what good looks like. And so when you're given your bit of work, certainly as an intern, but even as first, second, third year analyst, it's normally quite a clear brief and the person giving you the work is normally when you give it back to them is normally going the equivalent of that's an A star or a B or whatever, or that's a seven out of 10. They have quite a clear idea of what they're looking for often. And it's how well do you match up to that? Whereas I think that's the sort of thing with entrepreneurship, particularly in the early days is you're really having to create stuff out of nothing. Mm. And that's not necessarily what you get in, in those worlds because particularly early in your career, you're sort of more encouraged to just, do the work you're given to an exceptionally high standard so it's amazing for that but it doesn't necessarily foster that creativity of okay there's no we don't have a solution for this problem at all you need to sort of magic it up out of thin air mm-hmm. yeah and, and that's what's interesting right a lot of folks come out of you know university or, or, or even maybe an, even an mba program and want to go work at a startup because they think that, mm. oh, that's exciting. And, and it for sure, I mean, listen, cre- if you're a creative person and you get a kick out of getting a blank slate and, and yeah. them saying you create a solution for this, you know, it takes a high level of confidence to think that whatever I create is going to be even good enough to consider. Um, and it's certainly a, a really fun thing. But I guess, you know, you step into a role, you've never had an organized you never worked in an organization that forces you to work within boundaries yeah. and then you, and, and, and there's value in it. And so I actually, that's why I really asked this question, you know, for someone who thinks if someone is self-aware enough at the ages of 17 through 22, you know, to say, I am the kind of person who wants to be creative. I want to go out. I feel confident in my decisions. You know, I want to be an entrepreneur or I want to have, you know, more flexibility with my work product. If someone knows that well enough, I would actually tell those people, great, during the time that you're at uni, go work in the place that is going to feel as constricted as can be, because the things you won't have to do it full time for the rest of your life. You already know that. Yeah. But then the things that you get out of it, what, you know, what we're talking about will help you more 
you know, effectively, uh, uh, you know, deliver these things out of out of nothing, you know? Yeah, I, I, I 100% agree with you on that front. And it's, it, chiefly, if I think about even, you know, we've had some summer interns at Perch Peak, and I, I'm sure they've learned a lot, but I guarantee they won't have learned a lot <laughs> as much as they did in that environment, which I think is sometimes countered, certainly in terms of like, tangible skills of that they can pretty much use anywhere and I, I would definitely agree with that assertion that if you feel like you have that drive and creativity innate you sometimes that can get dulled if you stay somewhere for like 15 years or something yeah. but if it, if that's innate that's amazing get like get the skills and then yeah you're still probably quite like is you're never too old like what most founders are in their, their 40s whenever they're the they're really successful ones so it's like it's just incredibly useful to have a great environment for learning, which is that, that, that those places before starting out on yourself. And then you know how to, because that's the other, and we're sort of jumping ahead a little bit here, but I just will never forget the time of like the first days of just doing Perch Peak full time where you're like, wow, like there's 12 hours in a day and you're like, what am I going to do? And you're like, there's no meetings, there's no training. And you're kind of like, oh, that's, not like what startups are like, but it's it's good to have sort of some structured learning, I, I think, and it's certainly not a blocker to, to successful companies in any way. So. Yeah, no, that's that's great, I, and I, I'm, we're definitely going to get into that because I, I definitely experienced that myself. You know, of realizing, wow, I have to create my own work. Oh no, you know, yeah, it's um, such a, and you're like, wow, like it's amazing how just busy corporate life is often where you get kind of get ferried around and then there's write-ups for meetings mm -hmm. and then you've got to produce this doc and there's this presentation and just the blank slate is a, a is a, a funny moment yeah um okay so i i love that so i, I do want to you're at credit suisse as an intern you know you spent some time there you graduated from from university and i think you studied if i remember correctly like philosophy, politics, and economics. Is that right? Yes. Because, and I remember that specifically because I was a financial economics major oh, nice. and um, I ended up staying at college for five years. And then I double majored in my last year in what we call philosophy, politics, and law. So oh, nice. your, your, your degree was like a, a combined version yeah. of the two, two degree, de, you know, concentrations I had. Um, but you, you then, um, I know that you went to uh, work eventually at, at Amazon and, you know, in sort of in a corporate environment. Um, but one of the things that uh, you and I talked about before that I really want to dive into a little bit is you ended up traveling the world, right? Yeah. And it, it sounds like before you took this job at Amazon, but after you graduated from yeah. from uni. So can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I, you know, I went to travel. I did the kind of Euro trip, if you will, yeah. before between college and, and law school. Um, was Was that the idea for you that like, okay, let me take a quick trip before I take a corporate job? Or was it, I just graduated university, I'm just going to buy a one-way ticket and see where life takes me? Yeah. Um, so, it's, it, I, I mean, it links into that, um, the, the Credit Suisse internship. So, I, I did a three-year course. Um, there was a weird thing in the UK where the, and this is going to sound so pathetic for an american audience but like our our, our university fees were going up from three thousand pounds a year to nine thousand pounds a year so obviously by u.s standards that's small potatoes <laughs> you're like get over it paul but anyway yeah. for, uh, for us i originally wanted to take out a year up before going to, to to study but i was like well the fees are going to be tripled i may as well go and take time out afterwards um and and so i'd always like love traveling and um and then was that had a super hectic second year summer working at Credit Suisse and um, had some time for it, but not not too much. And the good, another truthfully calling a, a a spade a spade. Good thing about the corporate internships is they tend to pay well as well. So, um, and I was super fortunate to like bunk on my brother's floor, and I was working basically every minute of the day, so didn't really spend much. It was like I had some savings, had just like gone through. 18 years of school three years of studying was like look this is just really some a great time to just travel meet new people explore the world and was fortunate that uh, my brother who's a few years older than me had taken a year up before uni taken a year out after uni done a couple of years at, at a job and then taken another year out so he, he sort of set the precedent that mm -hmm. this would be a fun thing to do mm -hmm. um, and so it was just like look we'll go um we'll travel we'll uh, start in south america and 
was lucky to go all over the place truthfully and um it was just at the time sort of thinking like this is the best opportunity ever to have some savings be able to travel literally have no responsibilities slash kind of you know you're not not that like a career break is ever a, or is increasingly rarely seen seen as a bad thing but you know once you start it's like it's just too good an opportunity when you have no responsibilities no one's going to be like oh my god you took a year out post-college right do you not care about your career <laughs> you know, they're like oh you should have been there grinding so it was like <laughs> a, it was just too, too good an opportunity and that was def- definitely another special year in my life just did a lot of i think growing up and um at, at university but also d- during the internship and then um, just meeting so many people. Um, I was traveling by myself most of the time for, for, for nine months and just meeting so many people, particularly a lot of people who were on career breaks, which is fun. And you just sort of like probably made, met like a more diverse group of people in that nine months than like, you know, the 19 years beforehand or whatever. So it was just a, a really, really special time. And again, hugely privileged to, to, to be in a place to do it. And then eventually got to a time where it was like okay like savings aren't lasting forever should think about getting a job and then um sort of one thing led to another and i was sort of uh having to hop back home to to to, to find me to london and start working at amazon um i i want to i want to i want to learn about how you you know found this job and, and why amazon and, and that whole process before i do i'm curious you know you said you met a lot of people mm. Um, you know, throughout your travels, especially folks on career breaks, do you, do you, I mean, are there any sort of, is there an instance or, or anything where you thought to yourself, um, like, wow, this has been a really life-changing experience. Like, has it, was there anything that really changed you profoundly during that travels, especially since it was, I presume your first time for an extended period of time traveling, uh, around the world. Yeah. It's, uh, a great, it's a really, really good question and I was like there's so many amazing mm-hmm. moments but I think the probably the the time where I felt like wow this is so interesting was this this guy I met called yeah. Liam who I traveled with for a few months mm-hmm. and he was like a 29 year old classic Aussie kind of just like full of beans like loved getting on the beers um just like so 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 it was typical but he i just remember like look yeah you know, i was 21 at the time and spending three months and we did, did we're like just so much hiking together and just he just seemed so wise because he was just so he was like yeah i really just did a job for a few years because i wanted to save up for this big trip he was also on a year-long year-long trip and i was like wow that is awesome that he's just geared his whole life age 29 towards doing something fun for himself and like Hmm. i was at the time was sort of thinking oh great i'm having some fun now and then i'm going to be career for the rest of my life and it was just he was just like wow this guy is just knows what he enjoys in life and and goes from there and that that was kind of so yeah for for a 21 year old i was like oh this isn't the end once i stop (laughs) stop traveling you actually do have a lot of optionality um and that's the cool thing when you 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 travel right as you meet a bunch of people who have chosen their life path rather than have it chosen for mm. them and um yeah again it was sort of fitting into which is quite a big mantra for me now which is like you nearly always have more options than you think it's mm. very easy to feel trapped and often understandably so but you do there are often more options than you think and um and he was a big big uh driver of that mentality early early on that's awesome. That's such a great insight. And also, I mean, I think that lends itself to um, probably <coughs> being an entrepreneur and understanding mm. that you, you you always have more options than you think. And there's always a plan B, plan C, plan D, <laughs> even if you're not aware of it. But I would say um, for you, I mean, listen, as a 21 year old, the fact that you were aware of this and made this connection is is, is pretty cool. Like that, yeah. you know, you, you had the maturity, you know, to sort of pick up on that and, and have it impact you. Yeah. Well, and I think it, as always with these things it's easy to sort of look backwards and sort of stitch together a bit of a path but um it just it it, at at the time it was just so yeah it was like wow i'm 
so lucky to have this experience now and you also the other good thing about solo traveling in general is that having been through quite an institutional upbringing school then university you're basically told what to do most of the time right mm. it's it's internships you're definitely told what to do all of the time whereas here you're like literally you can you have to completely drive whatever you want and that that's also a good learning right to be like what do i want to do i can't mm. just sit back and and that sort of uh drive of like i've got to own my whole day here is, and fi figure out what i like doing and who i want to hang out with so um yeah that was and, and again i think just super privileged don't want to be like snooty about it but people often are like how oh, is that going to impact my career and I'd, certainly in startup lands i think whenever you see people who've taken a career break you're generally like oh, i just want to talk about it where do you go what was your cool experiences trade stories so it's uh um yeah very very lucky great learning and um yeah I miss it a lot to be honest because it's yeah. an amazing time in life well, I mean, listen, you're you're working out of, uh, or you're, I shouldn't say yeah. that, but you're you're in Colorado right now. Exactly. So, exactly. You know, wow. In, and, in in a sense, you're traveling. So that's yeah, awesome. and that's been a another huge, awesome, awesome change. And uh, we'll we'll come on to it. I spent ended up spending um, six weeks in Argentina at the time, which was a huge, huge learning experience as well. Um, and just thinking, I love the city. And at the time, it seemed like such a pipe dream because you're thinking about how your career might play out. And at the time, you're thinking, ah, it's going to be really hard to get a job in Buenos Aires. <laughs> you know, just at the time, you're thinking, that is like, I, I'm running through possible career options that I was just not on, whereas now like, I'm heading back there in a month for five months, which would be amazing. amazing. And wow. just, that's, that's super fortunate. So, uh, yeah, no, incredibly fortunate. And the way the cards are falling is pretty cool. So let, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, you're eventually afterwards, you know, after this sounds like a fantastic trip, you decided, okay, I got to, I got to get a job again, yeah, at yeah. the very least to make some money, maybe for your next exactly. trip, whatever it might be. And you were, you know, um, you, you had applied and, and, and found a job at, at Amazon. Um, tell me a little bit about, because as, as far as I understand, you know, this sort of whole experience of moving back to the UK and kind of starting to work at Amazon started to introduce you to the world of you know relocation in a sense or, or at least you know having this international journey um, as you were applying for a job so um, what was that experience like did did anything come out of that for you or was it just I'm going to apply for the job move back to to the UK and then and start working yeah I I think a uh, one of the things and that this is really really hard to think back like being the mindset was just like this was 2015 summer and it wasn't really certainly in the uk amazon wasn't definitely wasn't really deemed a tech company back then it was like a retailer in the uk it was just moving its offices from slough which is outside of london not a good place to be as a grad truthfully um to like a cool office in like the hipster part of london and so it was just not really a thing about it. as with so many things, there was some serendipity and just a recruiter who I'd met um, studying was just like, oh, they've actually just, you know, they're moving to London. They think they're going to be able to start hiring grads now. Um, so like you should take a look that for jobs that they didn't use to accept grads for, they didn't have a grad scheme at the time. Um, this is, and I joined literally two weeks after the first ever Amazon Prime Day, uh, which is which was crazy. So, uh, and so it was just like really getting going. And so it was kind of, A, that was one thing was like, wow, this is, this is going to be interesting. But I knew I wanted to work for a company where you were building, creating, doing rather than necessarily in professional services. That was one of my key, key takeaways. So um, anyway, so kind of was lucky enough to get this job and, you could tell it was quite funny because you could tell through the interview process they weren't really sure how to interview a grad because they were like uh, amazon has a very well-defined interview process <laughs> which is like really digs deep into your experience and mm. what you've done historically and i've just had all these people going you really haven't done much have you and i was like i'm a grad so like, <laughs> i don't know what you're expecting like i don't have like a massive job history so anyway eventually got there as you say moved to london um as, yeah moved to london that was a as you can imagine a, a very stressful process and was just like so much to do you're doing it outside of like 
getting up to speed with your job, just everything was moving with friends. So you're trying to coordinate all of them, one of whom was in the US at the time. So you're mm -hmm. trying to like do video tours with him. And it, it was just, that was such a messy process. And that was probably the first like lick of, wow, this moving process sucks. Um, wasn't necessarily at the time, uh, you know, we should start a business in this space. It was more of a kind of a, wow, this process really sucks. Like, think about that a little bit more and um, and go from there. Hmm. And so it's kind of one of those things where you had an experience, it, it impacted you, maybe you tucked it away somewhere. Yeah. Um, subconsciously, perhaps, right? Yeah, subconsciously, yeah. exactly. And you sort of think at the time, because I remember whilst I was, um, whilst I was traveling, I was thinking I might try and start a business straight away. Um, I was like, so I had a bunch of ideas floating around. Um, Can you share what some of those were? I'm yeah, curious. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, if you remember um, them, yeah, yeah, no, I do, I do, I remember vividly. I um, one of them was bizarrely, which is fun, funny, was a. I remember I'd been on a uh, like a holiday and been to a craft center and like had like hand painted a a, a t shirt with a colorful penguin. And which is funny, given like a colorful parrot is now our logo, but hmm. it was like, oh, this could be quite like a fun business to start almost linking back to the uh, experience I had with the hand sanitizers where it's like, it'd be easy enough to get some stock. People seem to be into this like hipster sort of curated t-shirt. You just produce, get a bunch produced or produce them yourself and then go out and sell them. And then various reasons, I was like, that's they looked horrible, so it was probably not going to be a good idea. But it was like, okay, that could be quite like a a classical business, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Kind of like you get your stock, you go try and sell it at a markup. You have, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like it could be a good learning, but it's very ex uh, expensive and cash flow stuff. Then another one I had, perhaps unsurprisingly, given my, my childhood, was um, a sports booking app which mm. still is much better than it was, but still isn't necessarily solved. Like if you just want to find somewhere to play tennis or to um, go to the gym or to uh, play foot five side football. Um, at the time it was like still very much, you just have to go on websites and be like tennis courts near me or tennis courts in Southwest London or whatever it might yeah. be. Uh, so that was like kind of like that. And then I thought, oh, that's, it has a lot of dependencies and, um, um, and and that was one and then um the other one that was actually quite quite uh related to to what we ended up doing with Perch Street was doing um video viewings for people relocating to, to to London or moving to London really um because uh it, obviously when you're from abroad and my my friend had experienced this it's who I was moving with if you're not actually there it's really hard to mm -hmm. see the place but you kind of often want to have a place for when you arrive. So anyway, that was the third idea. But I sometimes look back and think, oh my God, like we could have could have could have been a different story. Could have been a different podcast I for sure. Yeah. I mean those are I mean those are all great ideas. Uh I think the I, th I think I, I saw some ads for if I remember the name correctly, I think there's an app called Court Pals. Yeah. Where you can find someone to play tennis with. And it's yeah. like, yeah, it's I mean it's brilliant. But yeah, that's hard because you like you said, you gotta get it hundreds of you know, thousands and thousands of people it's hard i mean it's, it's 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 definitely tough one of those ideas that and so often this is the case like uh, and this is something i learned a lot at amazon was an amazing idea but just so many dependencies because you've got you've got to find the supply and you've got to get them signed up and you've got to get them to somehow keep their availability live so that's hard then you've got to find build the supply of people who are interested in using the product and it's mm -hmm. like you know, so you've got to have a court pal to, to do it with you. So very challenging as well. And like, if there's only one of you, it's not a great experience. And then you've got to find a way of making money. And you're kind of like, well, you go to all that effort to collect the supply for everyone. And people are like, well, I'm not that much more willing to book a court through you. You know, I might pay a couple of quid more, but I'm probably not going to pay loads. So it was just it was an interesting sort of one thinking through, like, great idea, but very hard to like, execute so that's why mm -hmm. i'm sure like uh court powers and stuff of like phenomenal entrepreneurs who are like smashing it rather than like sort of a, a weedy 21 year old just <laughs> hack, hack away in his garage but to your point you know the the conversation there is the this the conversation with yourself 
just thinking through that is um is important so mm. so so okay so at that so you moved back to london uh i guess i can say that because you, you lived there at yeah, least yeah. during your uni years um and you started working at amazon now at what point did you start thinking to yourself like what happened that enabled this idea for perch peak to come to life if yeah. if there was an instance i mean it could have been yeah yeah, yeah. because i i would say it definitely wasn't like a light bulb catching and here we are today um because it sort of had the sorry i can just say there's a massive thunderstorm going on in colorado right now it's properly mental Whoa. like properly mental um the uh you know it's like quite unnerving when you can hear so much thunder and you're like whoa <laughs> um, but the uh the um so it definitely wasn't a light bulb moment had sort of been rumbling around when first moving to london as i mentioned and thinking this is a bit terrible bit crap and then um the uh, a lot of friends were moving to london having terrible experiences and then probably the one that as I got into it more and more, it's that Amazon's huge for talent mobility. And so started to have friends moving to Seattle, to Singapore, to Sao Paulo. And actually before I ended up starting Perch Peak was like, oh, I want to go live in Seattle or Singapore, or any anywhere really. It was like, and how amazing that they're going to make that happen for mm -hmm. me. Because that's normally difficult, right? To relocate somewhere, it's challenging and Amazon make it really easy. So people were like, literally staying at the company so they could go live in different places around the world but the process of getting there was just consistently pretty poor for them and um, particularly for sort of like more junior employees who didn't have like super handheld packages mm -hmm. um and that was just sort of after seeing that again and again we started being like okay like this moving process is pretty tough and um particularly when it comes to finding a home. And so just started noodling with a, 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 a very uh, old friend who eventually became my co-founder, Ollie. Um, and he had a bit of a background in real estate. And so we actually started off life as, okay, uh, why is the process of finding a home when moving so tough? And then we went through various things and eventually ended up with where we are today but that was the sort of first instance was like just seeing the pro same problem again and again and then we started thinking okay what aspects of this problem could we solve and then sort of same core problem and then just evolution of solution over the last sort of four ish years now actually even though we've only been live for a couple that, that's and that's what i was going to say i mean it sounds like you're the crux of the idea came from seeing Mm. assign you know people relocating yeah, having yeah some sort of challenges in their experience and thinking how can i solve it for them exactly. the, the, the thinking isn't how can i solve it for the company although of course if you make the process great for people moving you are solving a problem for the company you're solving the problem of people quitting because it's not a bad or, or like hating it and wanting to move back home and not complete yeah. their assignment um, exactly. but the, the, the the focus there is on the, the person moving is that and a hundred percent did not know that they were called assignees back then. That's right. for sure. So good yeah. catch of you. It was yeah. very much just like consumers. And we started life just have, because, and this is, I think it's really hard to think back now that I've been in the industry for a while. Like people, even when you hear of people relocating and friends relocating, and you see it all the time. You're not necessarily that aware of, the fact that there is this whole industry that often supports that and particularly for, for, for more junior employees so even though it was happening all the time you don't necessarily associate it with global mobility I, I don't think i'd heard of that term until two years in and we started looking at corporate like going b2b rather than b2c mm -hmm. um and that that and then sort of so we and that i think did stand us in good stead that we were from the start thinking about our own experience sucked friends experience sucked what could we possibly do about this to help the person relocating um, get get a uh, uh, get get a better experience? Mm. And it was it's so funny you say that because I was literally just on a call earlier today and was just sharing some slides. And we normally refer to um, our customers as movers or relocators, and they were like, "Oh yeah, you should not refer to them as well." people won't understand them as movers. They'll think that's like shipping and hassle because mm. the industry was just a, a funny sort of reminder of where we came from in terms of like the consumer background.
Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if you're, you're just thinking about the party and what you're solving for them, yeah. And not maybe necessarily about the vocabulary, but of course the vocabulary is important. Oh, right? super important. Yeah. Not only does it, is it specific, but it also shows that you know what you're talking about, you know, exactly. the industry, things like that. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's yeah. awesome. Um, and, and so, okay. So you, so you started having this idea, right. And you're, you, you, you found your co-founder Ali and yeah. you guys were starting to work on something. At what point did you decide? I mean, you're at a big company, I mean, Amazon, yeah. and it's continued to grow. At what point did you decide I'm going to leave my full time job and really, uh, you know, pursue this or at least try to go for this full time? Yeah, it's, a, it's such a a great question and one I I often speak about with with, with people, particularly right. like people thinking of starting a business, because I think I. I probably could have stayed at Amazon even longer in retrospect, but to give this sort of rundown was working on a really cool project for Amazon that uh, launched in um, November, 2017, sort of second half of 2017 had been sort of working on producing a prototype with, um, with, with, with Ollie for like a super basic platform that I don't know where it is anymore, but hopefully consigned to the dustbin of internet history somewhere not to be found but anyway so we launched this and then we were just really scrappy going on facebook going on the equivalent of craigslist trying to find people that were moving and saying hey use our platform we've just launched dot 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 so we started to get some users um and it was sort of working a tough job during the day and then but i still think that's probably the most productive i've ever been just because you're like wow like when you only have like three or four hours to work on something, you're like locked in. Um, so anyway, it got to a stage where we were like, actually, we have, we can get users. Maybe it's time to do some fundraising and see if we can raise some some money, which I think is, again, looking back, probably quite like a classic uh, entrepreneur's mistake of, oh, the problem here is that we don't have money. When it was like, the problem was that our product sucked. And- <laughs> And we didn't have good channels. So it was anyway, so we went out and started to like reach out to angel investors and stuff like that. And basically as that process went on in early 2018, we were like, okay, well, like it looks like we can raise some money here. People are interested in what we're building. We should probably go full time to, to make that happen, which I think was the right decision. And we got onto an accelerator program, which was awesome. I think in retrospect though, as soon as we got money, we then completely rebuilt the product. And I'm not a coder, so it was kind of like during that time was doing market research, but probably could have kept working another six months, truthfully, because um, it was only once we launched that started to be super, super hectic again. But um, yeah, it was the investment that sort of drove, like actually almost gave us the confidence that like, well, other people think this is a good idea. Let's actually go full time and make it happen. And of course, having the investment allows you to you know, quite literally leave yeah. a job and, and, and you have at least some resources for, you know, some runway. Exactly. Um, can you share, I mean, if, if you're able to, if you're allowed yeah. to, can you share what that first sort of investment looked like or maybe ballpark even? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was around 200K. Okay. And I remember that is still a lot of money, but um, at the rent, I, I'll never forget the first time someone was like, yeah, yeah, I'll invest 10K. And you're like, whoa that's a crazy crazy moment in in your life so um but that ended up being about 10 or so angel investors and then one sort of early stage accelerator program um and but i must have spoken to i don't know 200 people (laughs) various introductions because i literally the start of it was just going on linkedin and typing in angel investor london and just spamming anyone who could would take a meeting and then going from there so it was like a properly crazy process but um yeah sort of got us up up and off to the races that's so cool uh i, I love that too because first of all everything's relative you know now you look back on that yeah. and think, well maybe it's not a lot of money and and now you would feel so much more confident but at that time it was your first time doing it it was your first business and to have someone give you some of their hard-earned money i mean that's yes. that's crazy yeah really really crazy and I think whilst it definitely didn't solve all problems, I think the good, one of the good things was A, confidence, but B, mm. um, B just almost sharpening the focus of like, mm. 
like a, a relatively competitive person and you're like wow i really don't want to like just lose these people's money i want to make something of it so to mm-hmm. speak which is not that obviously you'd want to do that anyway but it was um yeah it was quite a good process from that side of things um so all right so i i you know at this point you, you've raised some money um and, and you started to build your prototype you know i we, we could dig into kind of what that first first prototype um was but my big question is before we get into what the company does today um my big question is you know did you launch as something different from what it is today i mean i know you said that you've sort of relegated yeah. hopefully relegated that initial yeah, yeah. prototype but like so it sounds like there was a pivot at some point so can you just talk a little bit about that like what did you launch as and and why did you eventually say okay if we're going to move forward we can't do x we now have to shift to y yeah yeah absolutely so the uh we started life really as a home finding platform right uh really in some ways trying to compete with the equivalents of zillow for consumers and our big thing at the time was using machine learning to help you recommend the right home in the right area which is great it's obviously super applicable for people relocating because they need to know which area to live Um, But we initially launched it for consumers at the start of 2019. And I think in that first year, we learned two real things. Um, One was that uh, for people relocating, whilst the search is a core part of the problem, like finding the right home in the right area, there were lots of other things that they were struggling with. And they were like, right, can you help us, you know, with the offer letter, with setting up a bank account, with getting set up the equivalent of the social security, the whatever, the, the local gyms, all of these other things. And so then we were like, okay, it doesn't feel like we're solving enough of the problem here to, mm. to, to justify them, that, them using us. So that was when we started thinking, okay, we should go a bit more extensive and be like a full relocation platform rather than just for like the search. So that was probably pivot number one and that was very much like a customer driven pivot Mm. pivot two was a business model pivot to say a big problem with consumers is that they tend to only relocate once so you're spending marketing dollars to find the person moving from seattle to london and then they move there and you're like okay great right back to the drawing board let's find the next person moving from chicago or from mumbai or wherever so it was quite like a challenging business model and that was when at the end of 2019 we thought okay we've got uh we've got like a early stage product that we're happy with we've got um let's start exploring the corporate space because they relocate people all the time and i actually started speaking to some ex-amazonian friends i was like what was your actual relocation like what support did you get um and then again a lot of linkedin stalking later and we ended up in global mobility and that's been a a fun time ever since even though we jumped in in early 2020 which is probably the worst timing in history but it was good for us and and i want to ask you about that so uh, um if you can summarize you know for the listeners and the viewers um at this point what does perch peak what is perch peak today i mean explain it to folks who may not know exactly so we are um uh, a platform that guides someone relocating through every step that they need to take when they're moving from point A to point B. So let's say they're moving from uh, Chicago to London. We're going to help them uh, find their house, set up their bank account, get shipping quotes, find, um, uh, get their insurance sorted out. How we do that is we combine relocation experts who sort of talk to you through the app with content, partnerships, social nudges based on the data we have about the markets. Um, So we're still very early days, I would say, but like we create this um, experience where you can both research things yourself within the PerchSuite platform, but receive expert guidance from your relocation coach whenever you need it. So it's obviously a very emotional time relocating. So like if you're stressed or you just need something unblocked, you've got the support there to, to, to open things up. So and um, depending on exactly that, that can cut a lot of different ways, but that that's like the, 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 the user experience. And, and uh, you're, you're helping individuals after, do you help with domestic moves as well? It doesn't have to be cross border, does it? 
doesn't have to be cross border. So about it's about sixty percent domestic, forty percent oh, wow. international. Mainly in the US, obviously the US domestic market is huge. Um, so yeah, but the the, the outside of the US, it's seventy percent international, thirty percent domestic. Um, US, it's like ninety percent <laughs> domestic. To be honest, because and, also and, it's, it's hard to get visas in the US. But, and that's um, what I was gonna. That's what I was gonna ask. I mean, with a domestic move, you know, there's no immigration component. With an international move, there is an immigration component. And I mean, I understand that Perch Peak is not uh, a, an immigrant, like a, a global visa management uh, platform, but do you have any sort of anything there? Or is it like, okay, once you've gotten your visa and you're legally able to cross, this is where Perch Peak comes in and we can help you manage that whole process. Exactly. So it's, it's post visa, mm -hmm. truthfully, for us and the people, the companies we work with so far, most of them have existing providers or if they don't we recommend someone in our network to say look this is there and we're often working alongside existing relocation management companies or existing immigration providers mm -hmm. um and really because we're saying look this is the best tool once you have your visa to like organize everything else mm -hmm. um but as you know better than most immigration is a tough space so i think it would be a whole nother kettle of fish we'd rather just partner with the best people for now 100 <laughs> percent. it's like so, and and your and your clients are like the, the you know I guess I understand that the person who's using and benefits from the platform is the assignee exactly um, whether international or domestic but your clients I mean who the the the, the entity that you sign a, an agreement with I suppose is that the employer is is it the RMCs is it you know like how, yeah. what's the what's the business and I'm I'm asking this specifically because depending on who's listening, I would want someone to say, oh, that could be me. Yeah. I'd love to like learn more or whatnot. Yeah. And th that's definitely been one of the nice things for us is that because we're an assignee facing tool, we can partner with anyone that basically has assignees that, that don't receive this type of help. So when we work alongside relocation management companies which is most of our business we're acting normally as a digital dsp but there are so many employees that just get a lump sum or you know don't 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 really get this type of help so we work a lot with relocation management companies we work a lot with immigration companies actually because it's quite a natural handover to say great you've got your visa perch people will help with the, the rest mm -hmm. um and then the third one that we help work with is companies directly because we say look okay you know, we can help your employees soup to nuts. Um, so yeah, so th those are the three main buckets. Um, but we're still super young and finding our feet. So, um, but the RMCs have been great partners for us so far because they have a lot of um, clients. They have a lot of people relocating that need support, and we're sort of saying, "Hey, here's great support for them." So it's been a, a nice match for us in that space. So I have two questions for you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them in sort of what I think is a chronological order. Um, you know, you, you sort of, you launched, uh, it's, you started working on this in around, I guess, late 2017, right? Exactly. Tinkering and working. It sounds like you launched officially in sort of early 2019, exactly. right? Uh, which is actually about the amount of time it took for us to launch Laborless. I yeah. started working on it in uh, kind of mid to late 2016, thinking about it and what, talking to people and we launched in early 2018. Nice. Um, but then obviously, you know, it, it, you said in like late 2019 is when you started working a little bit more with, with, with or start digging into how you can help companies. And then obviously that's when talk started about this thing called COVID. Yeah. In early 2020, at least on the US side, that's when we first hit our lockdown. And I think soon thereafter, most of the world shut down. Um, I mean, were you freaking out? I mean, because now you're like, you left a job, you started this company yeah. that's based on people moving and like borders are closed. Yeah, it was, I would say, freaking out. And also we just had pivoted into like this space and it was just, we had, we'd been to one trade show in December and we had three trials that were supposed to kick off in March. And obviously they all just got canned. I say, I really was, you just like, oh, well, this is sucks. Like, if you can't leave your house, you're definitely not relocating. Like that's right. you know, really bad for business. Um, I would say, though, truthfully, where we were so lucky was because we had just pivoted and were super small, we didn't have a big bank of existing clients that suddenly you go, the demand vanishes overnight and your revenues go to zero or near zero. That would actually be much harder for us now because 
you know, suddenly, you know, you're factoring, you're like planning your business and you're thinking, okay, like, you know, we've got all the revenue coming in from our clients. If that went to zero now, that would be a real disaster. Whereas at the time it was quite good because two things happened. One, people in the industry actually started to have a lot more time to talk. So we were able to do so much research. Like Mm. at this stage, it was weird. We had a nice consumer product, but we knew nothing about the industry really still. So I remember like we would, we did like weekly one-to-ones with um, people who worked at RMCs, just like learning about the industry. And that was, trust me, but I catch up with some of them now and she's like, God, I can't believe I was able to do that back then. I would never be able to do that now. So it was amazing for product development. Mm. And the second thing as time went on was we're a sort of a digital first solution and normally deliver services unaccompanied and that became a lot more necessary truthfully during 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 COVID as people became able to move again they didn't necessarily want to like there were still restrictions about how many people you could have and stuff like that so like digital services became a lot more uh palatable for what's a relatively traditional industry still so um yeah we were quite lucky on two fronts really there i think that's such a what an interesting insight where you know if you can survive throughout a downturn yeah. in the industry i mean this was a global pandemic every you know but but even if it's something more localized or or within a niche industry if you can survive i mean to look at that as an opportunity to talk to people who have maybe more time on their hands or people who are you know worst case scenario laid off and now perhaps you know maybe you can hire them as a consultant just to learn you know now you have all this opportunity to gain insight into an industry that all of a sudden had to hit the big pause button yeah um really interesting yeah. really interesting insight and probably something a great reminder during recessions during like challenging times for ind- businesses yeah. to say look keep the lights on um and, and and look forward like look ahead and and r- take this as an exploratory time versus you know time to worry definitely definitely and like definitely at the time we trimmed our burn as much as we could um we sort of you know got rid of our office straight away Mm. we stopped doing all sorts of things but it yeah it was i I think um yeah there's always goes back to that thought from earlier there's always like more options than you think right Mm. and it's just like kind of how do you take advantage of that um and not sounds terrible so i shouldn't say we. i know what you mean (laughs) take advantage of the fact that we didn't have any clients right exactly i mean how do you how do you how do you turn a negative into a poor and how do you grow from the best to a bad situation yeah and and now now you know you mentioned obviously you know and we all know this that international borders were largely closed yeah um but of course there was this large exodus out of you know metropolitan areas i mean in new york city that was the time when everyone was like, New York City's dead yeah. and all this stuff, you know, prices outside of the city were inflated like crazy because yeah. everyone was moving. People were buying, you know, sort of country homes with cash at prices that no yeah. one had seen before. And I suspect this was happening in other parts of the country in the world. Did that have a positive impact on, on you at all? Were domestic moves due to COVID in the early days were actually helping you pick up some business? Yeah, I- Definitely, because our go-to-market basically became reaching out to people on LinkedIn, which is a recurring theme of everything we did. I mm-hmm. absolutely love LinkedIn. So it's just like, you can just reach out to anyone in the world. It's amazing. So anyway, we, we would just uh, reach out to people and we'd say literally, oh, have you had employees request to relocate since the pandemic? And they often say yes, right? Because it's like, you know, everyone was leaving New York or San Francisco. And because of the type of move that was they would never support that. It didn't Mm. fit within typical parameters. And so we would then say, great, you don't even have to pay. Just send them to us so they can, we can get some reps. They can pay for us themselves if they want to. So that was an amazing, uh, yeah, headwind or tailwind for us to be like, oh, actually like, yeah, people are still moving. They're not moving. They're not like traditional corporate moves. And that was really when we started to think, wow, like and learn, like there's, so many people relocating around the world that don't get any support can we can we support them and the second thing with those domestic moves which was quite uh useful for us was most people couldn't even necessarily offer support because um they were moving to places that people didn't 
traditionally move to right like most relocation providers are like great at moving people to new york or to san francisco mm. but when it's like oh yeah so and so's moving to like i don't know the suburbs somewhere shall we say they, they couldn't really support whereas our oh, that was where having a sort of a, a tech first platform was really really powerful um and stood us in very good stead truthfully so that was uh yeah two two strong tailwinds for us and, and again particularly when you're young and you're scrappy you're like we'll just take what we can get yeah. we'll practice we'll like and then you start learning over time and and then now at the time when we started a hundred percent of our business was b2b to c where uh like the employee would end up paying for us if, like the company would tell us that they're moving but with the employee paying you start practicing you start improving your product your processes and then eventually your product becomes good enough to say, actually, okay, companies will pay for this now. Um, and that's been a nice tailwind for us, for sure. That's awesome. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, so many lessons there, right? Especially for somebody who's early <laughs> on in their, in their, somebody who's early on in their entrepreneurial journey mm -hmm. to take uh, these opportunities to just grow and experiment and, yeah. and actually lean into how small and nimble you are versus, you know, a lot of companies say like, and I mean, we're probably guilty of this too, but a lot of very small companies are like, oh yeah, I'll talk to the board about this. Or, or yeah. you know, they have the, they have 15 email aliases to look as like they have a big team and it's all going to one person, yeah. you know, but, but I think like we, I've always been pretty honest and open about this. Say, look, we're a small company, you know, and, and the benefit of that is it, whatever you need, we can basically help help you with it we can make tweaks to the product we can build new features out you know we're, we're more available in, in, in various in simpler ways to, in terms of support um and i think uh you know yes there will always be companies that say okay well cool but we only really work with very established companies that, you know fine maybe that's not your your early adopter but there are other companies that say great we need this we don't have a solution there's no other solution in the market yes you're early um, but we're going to take use that to our benefit rather than look at that as a downside. And so I think actually being honest about that f helps you find the right, especially early customers yeah. that will totally accept you for who you are and, yeah. and how you are and, and, and you kind of work with and partner with you as you grow rather than just be a quote unquote client. Uh, and that, if I think of, yeah, and that, that's the best thing. And sometimes I miss that. We're still at a stage where you can, can get that, but like, not as much as in the early days where you're like build this with us like really be a partner give feedback and that's that was awesome and just it's the other thing when you come to a space and you speak to people and they're often excited that you're building something mm. and particularly if you're trying to solve a pain point that they are familiar with they're like oh yeah like you know i want to help you solve this problem um right. and that yeah that's amazing and just so many like good friends from doing that <laughs> truthfully people are still seeing and hang out with which is like yeah really really been a cool part of the the whole experience and a, a, such a benefit of being small and nimble and um yeah it does reduce as you grow that's all yeah, i love that yeah i mean the early clients are the ones whose like phone numbers you have and yeah they'll just give you a call and say hey what about this and you're like great we're on it yeah and, uh, yeah oh, I, I love that those are those yeah. are really fun uh fun times yeah and i think it's it's also for companies that are, are you know prospective clients who can see that they would know the advantage i mean it's only natural as a company grows for you to not be able to give that sort of attention yeah. to somebody unless they are truly an enterprise size client and they will pay you for yeah. that effort because in the beginning you have more time than anything else at this point it's like well you've got clients you have to yeah. support things if you want me to take my chunk of my time it just it comes at it's a natural progression of a business yeah um, and, and yeah I, I love that so and, and i want to you know now okay great so you've had this you know throughout a, an otherwise really difficult time in the world really you know you were able to um provide a service that actually ended up being quite needed which you know but wonderful right what a great you know, if you want to call it luck or you want to yeah. call it, you know, whatever, what a great place to be in. Um, now, I know that in 2022, you raised, you guys raised a series A yeah. um, of 8 billion pounds, 8 million pounds. 8 million would be great. <laughs> yeah. <Woo>! yeah. <laughs> right. 8 billion pounds. You can build a rocket ship and exactly. fly out, fly exactly. out of here. Um, no. So you, you raised eight, eight, <laughs> Yeah interstellar relocation exactly um it, but you, you raised a series a uh of eight million pounds and um you know i assume that that was on the you know on the heels of look 
our, our products growing, our platforms growing, we found we have this sort of momentum now of going from or, or potentially adding on uh, to the B to B to C route, the additional just direct B to B route. Um, you know, can you share a little bit about that? And and maybe you know specifically, like when did you decide? All right, we should raise some funds. Yeah, it's a. It, I'll actually probably jump back even one more because mm. I think it's a bit more instructive in the sense of. Uh, so we did our first like corporate relocation in um, June of 2020. Um, a chap called Luigi from uh, Italy to to Ireland, and we'll never forget it. And then throughout the second half of 2020, as we could, we started to grow quite a lot, and and through consumers like B two B C. And then we started to get into stage. Like, okay, we're growing. There's clearly something here. Um, and then then it was really a stage where we knew that we could do so much more with our product, but truthfully, we couldn't afford to hire engineers at the time because you know, we weren't making enough to do it. So we were like, actually, like the premise of what we're doing seems to, we're getting great feedback, we we're building like great relationship. We could move so much faster if we had more capital to, 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 to raise. And so that was when we decided to raise, did a 2 million seed in January, 2021. And then okay. similarly, similarly, last year it was, okay, we were growing relatively nicely. And I think both times it was like, we're growing nicely and we're bumping up to the point where you could clearly see where you could spend additional money. Um, and I think that was the time where it was like, wow, okay, like particularly for, for this raise, it was like we could hire way more, we could be m- way more aggressive with sales and marketing, we could hire way more engineers which is what we've mainly focused on we're like okay there's clearly a huge market here which is definitely something that investors care about like millions of people are relocating and they're like that excites them there's clearly some traction people are like semi-interested in what we're doing if we raise more cash then we could actually start you know building towards um sort of that that market and particularly for us because we had that b2b2c background we were sort of sharing that so many people don't get support when they're relocating or just get cash. We were sort of showing actually there is a middle ground between like a traditional expat package and nothing. You can use Perch Peak and it will be a great experience. And that, that was when we decided actually we're, we're capping out here. Let's raise some additional cash so we can go even faster. And so, I mean, I guess uh, from a, from a capital perspective, a capital raise perspective, is is because you obviously have to sell something. You have to sell a big vision, right, yeah. to investors. It's not a loan that they're expecting you to pay back. This yeah, is yeah, exactly. A piece of the company for a future kind of quite big returns, which you know comes with its pluses or minuses. There's pressure, right? I yeah, mean, you have definitely. To really, you have to go big, and and which is great. I mean, to have that uh, really kind of behind you. But I, I'm curious, you know what is the, you know, sort of what is the goal here? What do you, what is the vision? And I mean, and no one's going to hold you to this, you know, yeah, like, yeah. we know that companies pivot and move and you kind of go sometimes where, where the market takes you, but is the idea that you will be kind of the one-stop shop for you know, glo- the global uh, uh, mobility market? Is it, you know, like, what are your, what are your thoughts on like, what is the big vision that other companies in this industry can look at? Yeah. And I think for us, we tried to stay quite true for this of we want to build the best platform for helping anyone relocate anywhere with the like little side caveats that we don't do visas and taxes right now just because they're a whole set kill of this but hypothetically they're not like yeah anyway we, we have great partners who <laughs> can help us with that um the and i think really for us and this is the key insight and this is driven by our own personal experience is that the vast majority of people relocating don't get any support and so having a hugely stressful time and in investor meetings we just ask people like have you relocated before and if they say yes you go like what was your experience like and typically they had done it by themselves and it was stressful so it's like it's kind of quite like a a clear like wouldn't it be cool if regardless of whether you're moving to seattle or sao paulo or um, singapore there's one platform where you can go in and you're told exactly what you need to do when you need to do it, what other people did. And when you get stuck, you can get your relocation expert to dig you out of a hole and make sure you have a great experience. And I think that's where 
for us, two things are, are really important for that. One is be, being global and being able to help people move to, to, to lots of markets. And two is being affordable and not, which is kind of, and this is something that being at Amazon was great for is like, customers want low prices that doesn't mean you're a bad business sometimes businesses are like how do we just increase prices as much as possible for us it's like how do we make our our product as affordable as possible but still deliver immense value to to, to the person relocating and and, and that's uh, really where if we can keep executing on building that platform i think yeah we're in a good place because the sort of traditional global mobility industry has been a little bit more centered on traditional expats or assignees. Um, and we're sort of sitting there saying, that's great, we can help them. But what about everyone else who's just having this really stressful experience? Do they not deserve some support in their, their harrowing time? Um, and that, that's been quite, and we love speaking, you know, like we love speaking about, okay, great, you have graduates or you have employees that want to go and work remotely, you have employees that get a lump sum or they just get ship shipping or you know they don't yeah they don't they're still having quite a fragmented journey we love being like right give them access to perch beak and we'll let them out or oh, that's a theory anyway some days are better than others but generally i think it's, it's going okay i mean listen from from all the trends that i've seen you know number one early career professionals are trying to travel more than before and to your point the companies it's not feasible to handhold every early career employee, but many, you know, I'm a, I'm a sort of middle to late older millennial, yeah, yeah. you know, and sort and, and millennials and Gen Z's are, are, are I think consistently polling to say that they want to have experiences uh, abroad as part yeah. of their, as part of their job. I mean, I was one of those people I joined after I left, first of all, in immigration law, stupidly, I was like, well, great. My clients are all over the world. I'm surely going to be able to travel, yeah. but obviously if they're just all me. trying. They're all, yeah, exactly. You know? And so they're uh, not, uh, I'm not traveling anywhere. They're trying to come to the U S yeah. you know, and then, and then I, and then I joined a, I worked at a FinTech company here in the nice. U, in, in New York um, after I left the legal practice and before I launched laborless and um, we had offices. And, I mean, the company has offices in, in other parts of the world and um, I guess I probably could have pushed more. I had some colleagues that had some yeah. global, but none of my projects required me to move. And, you know, it never felt that I could even ask anyone. It felt to me that if I said, hey, can I just go work from the London office or yeah. the Mumbai office? They'd be like, no, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, sure. If you want to go on vacation there and pay for everything <laughs> yourself um, and, and you could we could we could allow you to, you know, yeah. to get your key card in and see the office, but there was no meaningful way for me to do that. And, and, and I wanted to, and I never felt, a, a, um, you know, I never, I had to really start my own. The first time I ever traveled for work was for my own business. Really? Wow. You know? and, and so it was such a, such a moment for me to think, wow, I'm finally doing it. But of course the thinking is if you work for a company that has global offices and you can do your job remotely, why not have that option? And so I think having a middle ground in terms of, you know, they can sort of self-manage it and it's at a lower cost, regardless of who pays for it. Um, I love this idea of having a platform that supports that. So that's number one. Um, the, that's the first trend that I see where I think a company like Perch Peak yeah. makes sense and, and has the ability to grow. Number two, uh, just last week, the guest on our show was, um, are building a, a platform that helps digital nomads you know, apply or, or folks apply for a digital nomad visa. Oh, a lot really? of those people sure are, you know, um, freelancers, freelancers and just, yeah, and, yeah. but yeah. there, I, there's a growing number of, of uh, corporate employees that go to their company and they say, look, I can go work in uh, Portugal or Greece or Costa Rica. Um, you don't have to have an office there. I could yeah. go there for legally with the digital nomad visa. All I need is just a little bit of support. And so they may say like, okay, this one's on you because you want to, yeah. We'll allow it because we want to keep you, and we know, you know, we know the benefits of, of of sort of working remotely, being in another country. But we can't support you with a full package. Yeah. And so similarly, like the trend is towards something that is more cost effective and allows people to to travel around the world and work there. It is, and and I think that's a one for us. It's like for us, it doesn't really matter whether we're helping someone move for an office based job, move because they want to work remotely, move because they you know just have us to move it but it is going to be a mix of office and in person like for us it's like if you're moving from a to b we can we can help you i think what we see is the barrier to relocation is going down as you said so many people have wanted to do this historically but it's only really been forward thinking mega global corporates like amazon 
that could have these huge mobility programs because you have to really have the infrastructure to make mm. it happen. Whereas now, as you say, like almost not regardless of the firm, but people want to live and work in different countries, sometimes permanently, sometimes for, for, for less time. But, you know, the cat is a little bit out of the bag and th that's where like, obviously bias, but people, more people will relocate than previously. And hopefully we're in good shape to, to try and help them do that. Touch wood anyway. Um, I want to take a quick break here just before, even, even though we're going to wrap up here, but I just wanted to, uh, just, I forgot to ask, even we got into such a great conversation. Yeah. I usually say to folks, you know, leave a comment, you know, hit the like button. So if you are still watching here, um, yeah. please, you know, hit the like button, hit the, li hit the yeah. love button. Uh, you know, ho hopefully you're enjoying this. So Josh Shack now says afternoon, Jen. So thank hey, Josh. you Josh for joining. Um, I don't know who this is. Unfortunately, you're, Security is not letting you uh, letting us see who you are, but good chat. Appreciate the focus on post visa mm. service. Nice. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm and I'm biased at that uh, because I come from the immigration side, and so my focus is always on the visa service. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Like as I, I've said this in a number of conversations, as an immigration lawyer, you know, we kind of are for international moves, like the kind of barrier to the, the move if there's yeah. no visa there's no move right exactly but but for us it's like great the visa is done next case exactly we don't think about or at least i as a junior level attorney was <laughs> never even told to think about like um you know hey look at the what happens afterwards after they yeah. get the visa and that's really where the journey starts for them right yeah that's the um, thing then for, that's the like the the assignee or the person relocating exactly. they're like oh great and now i can go that's when all the other stuff comes in and that's why immigration companies are such great partners for us because it's like if you can figure out you're like the handover is just kind of perfect for right. us to be like okay great now you've done we'll look after you for the rest of it but it is funny how like you get in your lanes and like because there are great companies that work even further downstream than us and they're like because we're really we get people from a to b get them settled then there's like huge community building right. downstream then there are people focusing on like repatriate like there's like all these different aspects but I've, there's it's a big industry at the end of the day exactly um elena anderson says i love to hear about the focus on early career professionals totally um mm. and it'll add so much value to their employment experience i mean i couldn't agree more and i think it's great that corporates are finally um you know kind of seeing this more and more and are in and are opening their eyes to you know allocating uh, resources, because it's easy to say, well, no, this person's really early in their career. We don't want to invest thousands of dollars into yeah. the move. Like, but you know, it's also when if they leave because they're not able to get that opportunity, um, you're going to spend way more money trying to recruit <laughs> somebody else, right? Or yeah. you know, why wouldn't you want to make somebody who's otherwise a great employee happy and and you know give them the opportunity and, and yeah. they can they can they, they that builds loyalty, you know, especially people always. You know, we, as the millennials, we were the butt of every joke about <laughs> like, you know, you jump around every two years. Well, you know yeah. what? I always thought that the world is society is going to look back, at least in, in America, North America, at millennials and say that we kind of forced the issue of, OK, we went too hard with the free lunch every day and yeah, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the yoga every single day and, and all that. OK, we've toned that down a little bit. But the point was we want to be happier at work we want to feel that work is more aligned with our life than just uh, the cubicle and so i think we're seeing the net effect of that today for sure. um uh, just a couple more comments here the h1b guy says, oh, hey, wow. well, great, great conversation name. great to see you h1b guy um yeah he's based in atlanta actually nice. so nice. uh everybody for great folks name. who want h1b updates follow um h1b guy on youtube and on linkedin as well um Aaron says, enjoying hearing your stories. Both of you seems like you're meeting a need and filling a hole in our industry, a hole, yeah. <laughs> uh, a whole hole. I should say. <laughs> uh, so thank nice you. For, so thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate your comments. Um, this is great. So I really appreciate everyone's comments. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Paul, I, I know we've had a, it's been a wonderful conversation. I do want to uh, ask you one last question yeah, yeah. before before we jump. What's Perch Peak? Where, where did that name come from? And, yeah. and tell me a little bit about the name and the logo, which is, wow. as you mentioned before, it's a colorful, yeah. I guess, a parrot, right? A parrot, yeah, yeah. exactly. So I, we have a few different versions, but this guy's the official logo. Where was he? Oh, <laughs> I'm such an idiot. I'm such a moron. I can't believe I just did that. Was like, You're just looking incredible. at the wrong side of your yeah, shirt. Yeah, yeah, I'm like literally the biggest idiot. Um, but something we glossed over in the early days of Perch Street was that we weren't actually founded as, as Perch Street. Believe it or not, we were um, founded initially as Easy Peasy Renting because we were. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, it. I know. I, know I it still. Was... 
I'm not gonna lie. I wish you were still easy. Easy peasy <laughs> anything is the best name. I know. I was lo- I was loving it. But anyway, then at some point we uh, like fairly fast. Like we were like, okay, fine, not easy peasy. I was I was just like, I-, I loved it. And then we went for quite a like a corporate name of Let's Step. And then we were like, okay, you know, if we're gonna be building this business for like 20 years or however long, like more. Hopefully, I love the space. Like, let's have a fun name. And so then we just wanted to have one that um, we could have an animal as the logo. So then we said, like, parrots are great. Um, and then we start just riffing off, like, okay, what would tangentially be related? Um, and then we're like, we'd heard somewhere that names with a K in it are easier to remember. No offense to label us, but we were like, <laughs> <laughs> but we were like, let's just have some fun. And actually, that's been one of those things that you do early on and you look back and would have been easy not to do. But wow we just it's been so key for our like branding our values our like how we operate obviously our merchandise as well but perch merch but yeah it's just been it's been it's been one of the best decisions we made was to to, to change the name to, to perch peak so let me ask you then what does perch peak mean to you yeah so i think it's funny because at the start it was like oh you know perch is like a home and peaking is like looking for it i i think now and it's funny as we've grown i think probably the two things we try and toe the line of are like being empathetic but having fun and achieving great performance which is comes back to kind of the the sports like sports teams growing up of just like how do you try and achieve that like elite performance and that that uh, atmosphere where like the team is the sum of more than the, the parts. Um, and for me, I think that the key elements are like people care about what they're doing. And that's one of the best things about this whole industry is like people are passionate about it, which is awesome. I'm not sure I could go back to an industry where people aren't like passionate, if that makes sense. Um, but then the second thing is just like having fun, right? Like you spend most of your working day, what's well, for waking day with colleagues or like chatting virtually to them, like, have a good time doing it and show empathy to them. So um, that that's what Perch Peak stands for now for, for me. Um, but I don't know what others would say. They'd probably be it. just like Paul telling rubbish jokes or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I so, love yeah. it. No, that's great. I mean, um, yeah, it, it evolves. You know, our, our names evolves, yeah. evolve with, with the business. And uh, uh, I think the idea too that your logo is a bird, and which obviously signifies migration exactly. to some extent, and the fact that it's colorful to me at least is kind of fun. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, mate, and colorful is it's so fun. It's a nightmare for our designers. They're like, why do we have such a colorful logo? That sucks. <laughs> but outside of that, they're like, it's, it's great. I love it. Um, that's awesome. Well, Paul, thank you so much. This is such a great conversation. I really love what you guys are doing. Um, you know, congrats on all your success so far, and. Uh, Best of luck, I think, as the world continues to shift in the direction we're seeing it go. I suspect that the need for your service will only grow. So uh, Cheers, looking buddy. forward to, uh, you know, following and, uh, the, the progress and, and watching where you guys go. Thanks, man. It's great to get introduced properly. And thanks for having me on. Absolutely, Cheers, buddy. Bye, Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Awesome. What a great conversation. I mean, these kind, I, I always, you know, the, these these conversations are supposed to be an hour long, but sometimes, you know, you kind of get into great discussion and uh, it's hard not to dig into everything. Appreciate everybody who's hanging on and, and hanging out uh, and listening and, um, of course, for your comments and questions. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope to see you here next week, the next few weeks. I'm not sure when we'll, if I will or will not have uh, episodes, just my birthday's coming up soon and, um so little things like that, but hopefully see you guys here either next week or, or the Friday afterwards. Um, in the meantime, please uh, check out Perch Peak. Um, uh, the, the information about uh, Paul and, of course, the company are in the notes in the show, wherever you're watching and listening to this. Um, and, um, yeah, in the meantime, have an awesome weekend. And thanks, everybody. Take it easy.